Open your Bibles, if you would, to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We are coming to the tail end of our three-year walk through the Bible. In 2021, we had done a one-year walk through the Bible, and now from 2022 to 2024, we're in a three-year walk through the Bible. This last year is focused on the New Testament, and each quarter we're beginning again in uh, the gospel accounts and then working through the epistles. We're coming to the middle of our second or our third quarter, and so we're on our third run through. Uh, a select group of books out of the New Testament. We're going to be in Philemon today, which talks about reconciliation. And so I'll just highlight the title of today's message, Ours, The Ministry of Reconciliation. We delight as Christians to be reconciled with God. And have you turned to Colossians chapter 1 because of our reconciliation with him? I'm going to pick up the text in verse 13, and you cannot help but read this text without rejoicing in what God has done for us. He has rescued us. He has redeemed us. He has reconciled us to him. Colossians 1, verse 13, speaking of God, who rescued us from the authority of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Oh, we delight to read of what Christ has accomplished for us. God has rescued us through Christ. He has redeemed us through Christ. He has reconciled us to him. And that reconciliation, although it was finished at Calvary, it continues on through us. Read with me here. Verse 21, although you were formerly alienated and enemies in mind and in evil deeds, but now he reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. We have been reconciled to God and we continue in that reconciliation process. Although Christ said it is finished, we too continue to reconcile others to God. We draw them in through evangelism. We reconcile within relationships that we have. That work continues. And so the main point of today's message, which shows up in bright flashing letters, it seems like in Paul's letter to Philemon, is God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is the main point. Christian, You have been entrusted with a critical ministry that was begun with Christ and continues through us. Ours is the ministry of reconciliation. And we're going to see that made abundantly clear in Philippians. In a few moments, we'll pray, and then we'll jump into the main body of the message. But uh, our prayer is going to involve appealing to God for supernatural power, because that's the only way reconciliation can truly happen. Then we'll jump into the context, because we have to get the context right if we're to understand the text. We're going to look at the author who wrote it, the ministry that is involved, and the gospel hope that is compelling all of this word. And then we'll jump into Philemon. We're actually going to cover the whole letter. It doesn't sound like a lot until you fall into the well that is Philemon because it is 
deep with truth. But we're going to highlight one particular aspect, the ministry of reconciliation. Afterward, if we go through the text of Philemon, we'll look at Paul's practical pathway to biblical reconciliation. He highlights a number of different aspects, uh, all interestingly, the start with the letter P, uh, that'll help us understand practical tools, how we can be reconciled with others to initiate, to facilitate, to engage in the act of reconciliation. And then we're going to conclude by going to 2 Corinthians 5, rejoicing in our own reconciliation and our opportunity to repeat it with others. Let's open in prayer. Father God, it is a delight to know you through your Son, to understand your love and your compassion, how you spared no expense to reconcile broken humans to yourself. Oh Lord, we love this about you, that we've been re rescued from the domain of darkness and redeemed with your son's blood. Uh, but Lord, I pray that having understood this, having believed it, that we would repeat it. Please, Holy Spirit, empower us in this critical work. We pray, like Paul, that the fellowship of our faith may become effective through the full knowledge of every good thing which is in us for the sake of Christ. Oh Lord, we desire to be about this work and to see you move and to praise and honor you. It's with confidence, Lord, we turn this time over to you. Equip us, prepare us, provoke us to action. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right. Turn with me, if you would, to Philemon. This is the smallest of Paul's letters, 335 words. Paul is in Rome. He's in prison right now as he writes this letter. The year is about AD 62, and he is writing to a friend of his by the name of Philemon. His intent is to reconcile two men. These men are Christians. They are brothers in Christ. One is a runaway slave by the name Onesimus. Somehow, some way, Paul has met with Onesimus in Rome. Onesimus is a runaway slave that has come from Colossae, where Philemon is a leader in the church, he has found himself in Rome, and he has come to Christ. And Paul is going to send Onesimus back to his slave master to be reconciled. That is the ministry that Paul is involved in. Although reconciliation really actually seems impossible, Paul is confident clearly confident that the gospel reality that has settled in the life of his friend Philemon, the leader of the church in Colossae, will manifest itself in reconciliation with this runaway slave to the end result that Philemon will even release his slave back to Rome to minister to Paul. That's the big picture. That's the context of this tiny little letter that Paul writes to Philemon. I've broken our text. It's only one chapter. I've broken it into four points. The first point I've titled Salutation. It's Paul's greeting to Philemon, and not only to Philemon, but the whole church in Colossae. Verse 1, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Apphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul writes a letter, not alone, but in community. He writes with Timothy. These are the writers, Paul and Timothy. And if you looked ahead to verse 23 and 24, you realize that Paul actually 
has quite an extensive team. Epaphras, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke. They're sending this letter. The letter to who? To Philemon. But not only to Philemon, but also to Apphia, Aristarchus, and to the church in your house. Isn't that interesting? This is not private correspondence just from Paul, just to Philemon. No, this is a community of believers sending a letter to another community of believers. Reconciliation isn't a private event. Did you know that, Christian? When one part of the body hurts, the whole body of Christ hurts. The application from that, Christian, is that we have a role in reconciliation. We have a role in encouraging it. We have a role in facilitating it, as well as initiating it. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and following. The Lord has equipped his church to go about the work of the ministry and be unified in the faith. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 says this of Christ. And he himself gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we attain to the unity of the faith. Unified in the truth, unified together, reconciled. The point I take is clear. We are not to ignore, we are not to write off individuals, nor are we to abandon them. No, if there is discord within the body, we are to unite in the faith, and go about the process of reconciliation. That happens within community. This isn't a private thing. It is a family affair. Let's go back to Philemon. Verses 4 through 7 is Paul's prayer. Paul writes, I thank my God, always making mention of you, in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the full knowledge of every good thing which is in you for the sake of Christ. For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Paul's gratitude is clear. He is grateful to God because he has seen God's work in Philemon's life. The reality of the gospel has taken root in Philemon. Those of us who have evangelized, those of us who know unbelievers, we look at the world in disarray. We know how rare it is to see someone living out their faith. And Paul is grateful to God that Philemon is living out his faith. He affirms him. He commends this living out. Verses 5 and 7 talk about how Paul has been rejoicing in the living out of his faith, and he affirms the gifting which Philemon has. Philemon is a hospitable man. This church is in his home. He knows how to live out his faith, and he knows how to refresh fellow Christians. So he affirms and he commends him, but he also petitions the Lord in verse 6 that his faith may become effective through the full knowledge of every good thing which is in you for the sake of Christ. Paul's prayer is that Philemon's professed faith would be and would continue to be both active and effective. What a tremendous prayer. 
from the apostle. Lord, I am asking that you supernaturally empower Philemon for this work, not only that it'll continue, or not only for what has already been accomplished, but that it'll continue. Here's an application that I take from this. Christian, I know that you're praying for your family. Are you affirming them and their gifting when you see them living out their faith? Are you encouraging them? You know how discouraging this world is. When was the last time you told somebody, thank you for cleaning the toilet here or taking out the garbage? When was the last time you told somebody thank you or encouraged them? I, I want to encourage and exhort you in this work. Life is hard. Ministry is tough. It's good if we affirm and recognize when the body is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Let's continue with Paul's plea. He's going to get down to brass tacks. In verse 18 or 8 to 20, he is going to lay out his request to Philemon. Philemon has this letter received by the hand of his runaway slave. He's reading it. He's wondering, how did this happen? And what is he leading up to? And we're going to hear it in verses 8 through 20. Philemon, verse 8. Therefore, because of all this stuff we've already talked about. Therefore, though I have much boldness in Christ to command you to do what is proper, yet for love's sake, I rather plead with you, since I am such a person as Paul, the aged, and now also prisoner of Christ Jesus. I plead with you for my child, Onesimus, of whom I became a father in my chains who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. I've sent him back to you in person. That is my very heart, whom I intended to keep with me, so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but voluntarily. For perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord, if then you regard me as a partner, accept him as you would accept me. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this to, with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention to you that you owe to me even your own self as well. Yes, brother. Let me benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart, Christ. In Paul's plea, he references the propriety of what he is asking him to do. It is proper. He references the promotion of the kingdom. He references God's providence and the partnership which they're both involved in in the furtherance of the gospel. He lays it all out. In verses 8 and following, he says, do what's proper. Paul's plea is based on what is proper, an absolute alignment of both faith and practice. It's reasonable. It's good, Philemon, that you who have been reconciled to God Reconcile with this new brother of yours, Onesimus. It promotes the kingdom and is attributable to the providence of God. Paul pleads with Philemon. As an old man, he's probably between the ages of 50 and 56. Some of you are past that. One Ancient historian said that Paul 
had reached the seventh age of man. He's not weak. He's old. He's experienced. And he reaches out to his friend to do what is proper. He sends this note back with Onesimus himself. And he says, with my very heart. You know, if you were to translate it literally, it would be his internal organs. He has detached a part of himself with this message in earnest to Philemon. He wants him to do what is right, to promote the furtherance of the gospel. You see, Paul is in Rome. He's sending Onesimus back. It, it's a journey at the fastest that would take over two weeks. The distance is similar to traveling from here to Chicago or the end of the Baja Peninsula. It's a long journey. This is costly. It mirrors the costly sacrifice that God engaged his son in. His son took on human flesh to reconcile us. Paul sends him back personally to reconcile with his former master, whom he had run away from. And he wants Philemon to send Onesimus back so that he can continue the work voluntarily. He wants him not to do it under compulsion. This isn't too much to ask. He says, if you regard me as a partner, accept him. Do what's proper. Do what's right. Send him back to me. I need him. If he owes you anything, if he owes you anything, hold me accountable and I'll make it right. The reconciliation that we have through Christ took a partnership. Father sent his son. The son came. The spirit sanctifies and saves. And we are saved through their partnership. That transaction doesn't end there. It flows through us. We take part in the reconciliation of others to God as well. Do we understand what God did for us? Turn with me to Matthew 18. I know that there are unreconciled relationships. I know that there's heartache. I visit with families and I hear of the reconciliations that we long for. I want to provoke us toward continuing to reconcile, to continuing to forgive. At the end of Matthew 18, Jesus is telling a parable to his disciples. And I'll just summarize it due to our time. But he, he tells a story of a king, a king who has slaves. A slave has cheated this slave owner out of a massive amount of money. In today's currency, it's somewhere around the neighborhood of 37 billion, with a B, dollars. If these 10,000 talents that are referenced are in gold, it's 37 billion dollars. The slave pleads with the king to be merciful to him. And the king, out of his compassion, forgives the slave of his debt. That is awesome. That is profound forgiveness. We're to see ourselves in light of this, understanding what we have been forgiven. But that slave didn't understand what he had been forgiven, did he? We'll pick up the text in verse 28. It says, but that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 denarii, that's 100 days wages, he seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. 
So his fellow slave fell to the ground and was pleading with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. Same words. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. He held a grudge. He demanded his rights. You're going to pay. You're going to give me my pound of flesh. That did not go unnoticed. Verse 31. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your hearts. Friends, I know that we have reconciliation work to do. It is my prayer that we will not go about in a way that hinders that work, but will manifest our understanding that we know that what we have been forgiven of is far greater than what any sin somebody has done against us. If this reconciliation work does not reflect itself in our understanding, in our action, can we say that we truly understand what God has done for us? No. No. From that, I would pull an application. Ready obedience to reconciliation reflects a real relationship with God and recognition of Christ's reign over us. Is he your Lord? Is he your King? Have you understood what he has forgiven you? then you will not withhold forgiveness. You will not withhold compassion or mercy. You will engage in this work. It's ours, this ministry of reconciliation. We're to facilitate it, initiate it, encourage it. Paul does. Now, let me add a caveat, because sometimes we find ourselves so at loggerheads with someone. Perhaps we thought that they were a believer at one point in time, but they're so factious, so contentious, that there is no reconciliation with them. What do you do with that? That's a reality that we confront. Go back from uh, Philemon to Titus. Titus chapter 3. It's just a book back. It's just a couple of verses before where we've started. Philem or Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. Paul tells Titus, ministering in Crete, he says, reject, reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. After having tried, after having prayed, after having labored for reconciliation, after having confronted with sin after a first and second warning, if that man, if that woman, if that person will not repent, they are perverted and are sinning. Reject them. Those are tough words. Those are hard words. But they're reasonable words, too. That does not alleviate our responsibility to attempt reconciliation multiple times if necessary. Okay, let's go back to our fourth and final point in Philemon. It's Paul's uh, final greeting to the church, to Philemon. And what's interesting here is the confidence that Paul demonstrates that Philemon actually is going to release his slave. The confidence that reconciliation will take place, even to the degree that uh, he's hoping that he'll have a place to stay when he gets released from prison. And then we'll talk about context, because the context really makes this pop. Verse 21, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you. 
since I know that you will do even more than what I say. And at the same time, also prepare me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers I will, gr I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Paul is confident that the reality of the gospel will reflect itself in reconciliation, in sending Onesimus back to Paul. Paul is confident, so much so, that he says, prepare me a lodging. I'm confident that you're going to do this, and this isn't going to break our relationship. No, I'm going to get a chance to stay with you. But the context actually bears mentioning a little bit too. You see this list of names. They probably don't mean a whole lot to us. Epaphras, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke. Buried within that list of names are two important stories. Demas and Mark. Some of us know that Mark had abandoned the work of the ministry. Acts 15 talks about that back in the second missionary journey of Paul. About 10 years earlier, he had abandoned the work of the ministry. He had left. And he had come back, and Paul had said, I don't want to take him with us on this next journey. I don't want him going with us. He abandoned the work of the ministry. And there was a sharp disagreement, and they split. But somehow, some way, over time, Mark and Paul had become reconciled. Do you think Mark would have an encouraging word to give to this runaway slave? Yeah, we're going to send you all this way. You can do it. Be reconciled. It's worth it. Remove this obstacle. Do what's proper. Do what's right. You see, it's not just Philemon that has to do what's right. Onesimus has to do what's right. But then the other side of that coin is this other name, Demas. Demas, he, he does desert Paul. 2 Timothy 4.10 says that he loved this present world, and he abandons Paul. And there's no word ever that they're reconciled again. They went out from us because they were not really of us. Demas loved this present world. I mentioned that just as an as a interesting look at the context because we're surrounded by all types, aren't we? Reconciliation must take place, doesn't it? That's ours, the ministry of reconciliation. It's hard. I agree with you. I know that it is difficult. And so let's look at Paul's pathway to practical reconciliation. I want to highlight a number of different things that pop up in this tiny little letter. All of them, interestingly, start with the letter P. The first step in reconciliation, and you better not try reconciling without this step. Paul doesn't. Verses 4 and 6 say that he prayed. Do you pray for reconciliation? Only supernatural power is going to make it possible. We know that. We've tried everything. Our toolbox is empty and nothing works. We realize, actually, yeah, this is God's work. He's got to do something supernatural. Pray. Look for the good. Praise it. Paul did. He affirmed him. He commended him. He looked at his spiritual gifts and said, Philemon, I know this is in you. Affirm the good, commend it, recognize it. It's going to be hard to reconcile with somebody if you come out guns a-blazing and say, you dirty, rotten sinner. That's, gonna, that's not going to help you. You'll have an opportunity to talk through. Praise what is good. Some of you might struggle with that. You can praise them that God has uh, given them one more opportunity to experience grace, his grace that they're made in the image of God. Look for little things that you can praise, if you can praise nothing else. Plead, beg, it's okay. Be humiliated, be humble. 
It's okay. Christ did. He was humiliated. He took on human flesh to reconcile us with his Father. It's okay. Go, hat in hand. Even if it's not fair, don't stand on your rights. Plead, beg. That's what Paul does. Here's another tool. We are a people that love to laugh. Potentially look for the humor. Now, you'd have to know uh, the original language for this to pop out, but I'm just going to lay it out for you. Onesimus' name means useful. Read verses 10 and 11 with me. I plead with you for my child Onesimus, of whom I became a father in my chains, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. There's humor in that. Look for the humor in the situation. Laughter is good medicine. Use discernment. <laughs> Use it in right measure. But look for the opportunity that, that understands there are ir ironies in some of these situations. It's good to call them out and say, isn't this kind of actually funny that we're doing this? Okay. Next, personally go to them. You say, well, Paul didn't. He wrote a letter. Yeah, he's in prison. He's chained up. We are not. He sends Onesimus back. Don't send a letter. Letters are hard. They get misunderstood. They get confused. There's extra tension. The person doesn't get a chance to respond. You basically enforce all of your will upon them without any reciprocation. Go to them personally. Go. Paul sent him back in person. Jesus came personally to reconcile us with God. Go personally. Persuade. Persuade them to do this voluntarily. You know, uh, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 17 says, of, Paul says, if I do this work voluntarily, I have a great, or I have a reward. There's a reward for doing this, not being kicked and beaten into it, but doing it voluntarily. Not holding somebody's sin over their head. Reconciling with them voluntarily. Partner with them in this work. Help them understand that you are both, if they're a Christian, both in the body of Christ. If it is true that we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, if we're both about that work, you should be able to partner with them. You should be able to do that. There should not be anything insurmountable. Put yourself in their debt. Verse 19, Paul doesn't ask that the, the issue of, of Onesimus just be swept under the rug. No, he says, if, if he owes you anything, I'll pay it. Somebody's got to make it right. Somebody has got to own the issue. Somebody's got to eat it. It'll be Paul or it'll be Philemon. You know, sin didn't get swept under the rug. When Christ paid for our sins, he paid for all sins. All. All of our sins. That atonement is complete. He paid for everything. He doesn't just keep a box full of unpaid sins out there somewhere. They're all paid for. Put yourself in their debt. Put yourself, we're people that likes reciprocity. Res relationships, I do you a favor, you do me a favor. It's okay to put yourself in their debt. To say, I'm going to do this for you. It's okay to do that. That might initiate a stalled out engine of reconciliation. I'm, I'm looking at or I'm not sure I'm communicating well. So I'll try and say it again. <laughs> when things break down, do them a favor. Be kind to them again and again and again. Try and restart the relationship. Does that make sense? 
that might mean that you're in debt. Prepare for the best. Paul did. He has confidence. He pleads with Philemon. He implores him. He uses humor. And he confidently entrusts it to the Lord. What, what better thing can you do? The Lord has already done work in Philemon's life. He's already done work in Onesimus's life. He's already done work in Paul's life. He's going to bring this to a state of completion. He confidently turns it over to the Lord and says, this is yours. We've done everything that we can. This is yours. So prepare for the best. In today's message, we started out by looking at our introduction in Colossians chapter 1, reveling in the goodness of God that he has reconciled horrible, rotten, dirty sinners to himself through his son. And we enjoyed how he has rescued us from the domain of darkness, how he redeemed us and reconciled us to the point that we engage in that work of reconciliation. God has given us the work of reconciliation too. Paul engaged in it. He invited Philemon to engage in it. He sent Onesimus back. This is our work too. We ask the Lord and we continue to ask the Lord to help us as we continue to reconcile with others that we are at odds with. We looked at the context of a community writing to a community. This isn't a private thing. This is a family thing. Reconciliation within the family. And we had a number of different tools that we looked at. Amongst which were to encourage our family to pray and affirm their gifting to encourage them to live out their faith, to implore, employ them to, or implore them to readily obey their Lord. And then we looked at the message that highlighted the ministry of reconciliation as seen through Paul in this letter to Philemon. We went through a number of different steps you can take in Paul's practical path to biblical reconciliation. I hope that was useful. And in conclusion, I invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to bear down on our understanding that we are obligated to engage in this ministry of reconciliation. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Are you new in Christ? Are you reconciled to God? Has he forgiven you a mountain of sin debt? The old things are gone. The sin debt has been paid. You've been rescued and redeemed. Therefore, oh, continuing on verse 18. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, Christian, you have good news of reconciliation with God. You have good news to live out in your own life and reconciling with others. The body of Christ isn't supposed to be this fractured, disunified, chaotic representation of the modern American family where nobody talks to each other and it's hostile and tense. That's not, that's not what we're to be about. We're to be a representation of the communion that God has within himself between Father, Son, and Spirit, in which we have been invited into. We have been reconciled to God, and we are the means by which God is engaging others to be reconciled with him. That's ours, the ministry of reconciliation. Let's stand, and I'll close in prayer.
Father God, to have fellowship with you, to have communion with you because of what your son has done is the greatest of gifts. Thank you for not winking at our sin. Thank you for not compromising in your holiness and your perfection. Thank you for not holding on to our sin, but removing our guilt as far as the east is from the west. Lord, I pray that as we understand what you have done for us through Christ, I pray that we would actively be engaging this world to allow them to understand what you have done for them. I pray that that work wouldn't end with our neighbors and our friends that don't know you, but even within this body. Lord, I pray that you would build us together. You have equipped us for the work of the ministry. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would empower us through the full knowledge of every good thing which is in us for the sake of Christ. Lord, I pray that you would bless each one today. I pray that you would bless us as we gird up our strength to engage once more those that we are at odds with. I pray that we would praise you for the result, whether near-term or long-term. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.